Welcome to the Home Lab Show, episode 106. It's time to audit your home lab. Whether you know it or not, you should definitely audit it, right, Jay? You absolutely should. I think I'm one of the few people that do this regularly, probably because I, I should probably have more hobbies in my life. But that's a total different podcast. We should probably stick to the auditing. Yeah. Well, we you know, because this is our hobby, we, we yep. do have this as a podcast because we're that's, a little bit obsessive with all this. You know, the reality is no one wants a backup that works. They want to restore that works. And I've said this a lot, you know, untested backups are just wishful thinking. So um, stop thinking wishfully and actually test your backups and all that fun stuff. And that's what the topic of today is. Well, not just testing backups. It's right. about how to audit and validate. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't realize they've lost data or are about to lose data until a system <laughs> fails. And you go, oh, I guess my data that I thought was being backed up or I updated a Docker container and I assumed my data was mounted properly separately, no longer is. It's a recurring theme. So we kind of yeah. walk through some of the processes of how we look at that. And I figured, you know, me and Jay talk about this a lot amongst ourselves because we, we're, we're double checking ourselves to go, hey, right. you know, what are, what are other ways I should have some perspective on this? And I'm like, wait a minute, this is a great idea for an episode. <laughs> it, it really is. And, and I'm kind of curious about this. I'll ask a question to our audience. Am I the only one that just regularly, you know, regularly audits the home lab for no apparent reason? Because if you think about it, you have enterprise companies that you really can't get them to do a good job of this. And then they they're in the news because they lose data or something. That's a big company with an IT team and they're still not doing a good job of it. But sometimes I wonder if home labbers are so in tune with their technology, because like you said, it's a hobby, right? So when it's a hobby, we're going to pay special attention to it. So it's kind of like, it's not as tedious as it might be for someone else who's not a, you know, that works in the industry. They're not a huge fan of it, but they work in it via, you know, us. I mean, did, does anyone in the audience just every couple of weeks or a couple of months just randomly start auditing things? I mean, that's what I do, but I'm just curious if I'm the only one. I don't think so, though. I guess we'll find out. Yeah, absolutely. I'm finding out that I need to turn off. You know, you get more things that beep and then I have to turn off more things that beep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the beeping things are driving me crazy like i have to probably buy a new fridge because that thing's beeping because the door won't shut properly and then oh. this thing's beeping then in here i have this and that and the other thing yeah yeah noise and audio is is just tough well this one was my fault it's my watch that was beeping i forgot to turn oh. off notices on the watch so i've been watching my health and uh that also has led to hey it'll send me notices and then sometimes you don't want them Nonetheless, right. <laughs> let's segue into the sponsor of today's show, and that is Linode. We have renewed our sponsorship with them. Where they will continue supporting the show, and we think it's a great place to run the cloud. Matter of fact, I just did a video on hosting your own Unify controller. I used a Linode instance for it. They have just a really slick and easy interface for getting things spun up, and it seems like a pretty good thing to host in the cloud is your Unify controller instance. So check out that video if you're interested in setting up a Unify controller and check out Linode if you're looking for a good place in the cloud to host that and many of the other projects that we talk about on this channel. Thank, th thank you for being a sponsor of the show. And there's an offer and a link down below to get you a deal and get started with Linode. All right, so yeah. let's get started with auditing. <laughs> yeah, let's get started with this. So I, you know, every now and then I feel like there's a topic with my home lab that's just staring me right in the face and I, I'm just blind and I can't see it. And then, you know, sometimes I see it and there's a million of them, but the auditing thing came up for me, for one, based on your comment, and I'll let you say it again. I forgot the situation, but something about the data, I thought the data was there in the container. Um, what, what was yeah. that again? Because that's kind of one of the things that it helped inspire this idea. So this is a, you know, TrueNAS has unfortunately been the subject way too frequently of a problem. Since they moved over to TrueNAS scale and they're using, ah, uh, well, a implementation of Kubernetes and Docker all combined together. And then you have the waters being muddied by places like true charts. And I say muddied because they prefer some different types of storage and it's not as clear where that data is, which has led to, because we offer consulting, not just me seeing posts in the forums, but an unfortunate number of people reaching out because they have updated an app or broke something and it lost the data. It wasn't putting the data where they thought it was. And this is one of the first things we really want to just consider, especially with, hey, Docker's awesome. It's a magic incantation to some people that will simply spin up an instant loaded application without all that you know pesky work of setting up and dependencies and configuration. While that's good, 
I always am a little hesitant to people who don't take the time to understand exactly where their storage and more specifically where their data is living. And this is why before now I, I admit like I've used that type of storage inside of TrueNAS where I don't care because I'm spinning up an app to go, does this app work? Cool. It works. Okay. Can I spin it up again? Delete app. Where'd the data go? Oh, yeah, I should probably go through and set up these host paths properly and validate how you attach to it. Matter of fact, I even filed a bug report because their first version of NextCloud was very buggy. And even though you specified where the data was going, they had a variable mismatch. So your specified location didn't actually put the data exactly where you thought it was, which led to, of course, people when they would load updates, losing data. And that is obviously something you really want to avoid. So this is why this topic came up and kind of auditing yep. that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of where this topic led. We, me and Jay had a pretty long discussion yeah. about TrueNAS last night. <laughs> Yeah, we did. And I think um, without going on a tangent, I'll just say, based on what you've told me, and, you know, disclaimer, I have very little experience with TrueNAS Scale. I use TrueNAS Core currently, and I'm just kind of waiting for the um, interesting conversations to die down before I go to yeah. TrueNAS Scale. But it, but um, as you describe to me, you know, the Kubernetes implementation, I keep thinking, what? <laughs> Are, what are they doing? Like, I don't know if it's just maybe something I'm missing and it's fine, but based on what you describe, it's just always this weird um, topic. But then, you know, of course, we get into the, my my data was there and now I'm, I'm getting like this um, screen that's like the first screen you get when something is not is not set up, you know, name your app or put the settings in, but I'd set all that, where'd it go? And that that kind of led to this, but also in parallel, I, I just habitually audit my network. And I think this might be a home lab thing. Like I just check things. And sometimes it's a matter of, I want to consolidate code. Maybe I found a way to do something in Ansible with fewer lines of code. And this is kind of how it is when you learn. So you go back to your older stuff and then you can shrink things down because you found a more efficient way to do it. And that's not really auditing. It's kind of code auditing, but it is consolidating code is fine, but that leads to things. You're like, yeah, but this implementation, I haven't checked on that in a while. I haven't checked on this in a while. And I keep, and then eventually it became a habit. I just like, usually every other weekend, I'm just checking the backups and um, the backup chain as we're going into. And then the most interesting thing and the most frustrating thing for me is that question, how did this ever work in the first place? Like you have something that <laughs> you, you, implemented and you're like you're set you sit back and you're like in awe of how great this is like this this solution this application that you're running whatever it happens to be and it's working it's fine you're like wow i created this thing and it's just working fine i'm i have my data my data in there and then eventually it stops working and then you find the problem and then you're like well how did it ever work because it can't work with this setting but it was working but now it's it you never know right and i keep running into weird things like that and i feel like it reinforces the auditing persona because you know you keep finding things that you're wondering how it worked in the first place and um, things you could do better next thing you know you keep making your home lab more and more and more efficient but i'm not sure that everyone does this because you know we get comments about um you know losing data and things like that so with attention to detail it's harder to lose data not impossible so it kind of makes me think that maybe i could be one of the few people that do this regularly. Maybe most most people find this tedious and they want to avoid it, which is fine. Um, it's not the most fun thing I've ever done, but now we have the topic. Yeah. Now, one of the first things I want to mention, and this actually isn't on Jay's list, so I'll bring it up before we jump down our punch list that we have here, is when you're thinking about this, this is a good, what we refer to as a tabletop exercise, is think about bare metal restores. For example, you may have a password manager. It can be an external one like Bitwarden. That makes it kind of easy, but it also could be an internal one that you're using. KeyPass is really popular in a home lab, and it's a great system. But what are you doing to make sure that your KeyPass database is where you need it to be because what if you lost your primary nas and you're like oh no problem i backed it up i encrypted it before backup so i have it securely stored in an encrypted form in the cloud and like great how do you get into that cloud service how do you 
get that encryption key you need for it. This is something you should always walk through is what does a bare metal restore look like? Step through it. And you don't have to do this. It's more fun, of course, if you do rebuild it on some other piece of technology to see if you can get things up. But this is where, especially from businesses, this is a problem I've run into a lot when we take in over IT, especially when they had kind of their friend helping with IT. We had a client who stored all of the API keys they needed and all of the encryption keys on the server that they were backing up. Like, oh, it's all encrypted at rest in the cloud, fully compliant. And when the server had failed, this is how we met the client. Um, they're like, yeah, we have the encryption in the cloud, but no one backed up those API keys and no one knows the really long string that was made that was saved in a notepad on the desktop of that system. And it was this fire yeah. in the building. So things were melted in a way that you couldn't Ooh. do data recovery. And we could not recover that data. Wow. And it came down to their all their backups are fine. Matter of fact, all the logs from the email said, oh yeah, and we could tell there was all the data was in the cloud without that one key. And no one ever thought to have that key anywhere else but the desktop of that computer. They always like, yeah, when I and, they, and they had done restore tests. They actually had a pretty, what they thought was a thorough process, but it all came down to where are those critical security keys? And you have to think about that from a very big picture, sit down and draw this out on paper. Step one, where are my security keys? What is the risk of those? Because it's awesome that you're encrypting everything. I think it's a great idea, but it's with risk. And that risk is making sure that you've mitigated the risk by, do you have it? I'll also kind of reference, and I didn't read the whole article because I was aggravated. I was wondering if you're referencing what I think you're referencing, but continue. No, well, this, I, I seen this article come by last night when I'm flipping through things because I watch a lot of some of the video stuff, and I believe it was probably Vice News, one of the big news organizations, Vice or Vox, begins with a V. It's in my YouTube subscription somewhere. Um, they were complaining about having lost data on one of the Sandus um, because it failed, but I'm also like, you shouldn't just have a single piece of media that has all the critical data on there. Even myself, I do have backups on encrypted drives of my SSH keys. And it's in a plural because my SSH keys are my key to getting back into many systems. I also have an offline copy of all my passwords. I export out of Bitwarden and I keep them on multiple keys. And I audit those keys and every now and then, like on a schedule that's set in the calendar. So I I say every now and then there's a timing. I do this on the first of each month. I run through right. the process and I re-download and re-export them and there are multiple keys. And I re-verify that these keys are readable. So I've tried to mitigate it in every possible way I can. So I know if you were to somehow magically wipe out my computer systems that I have access to, and there's more than one of them, and you wiped out my SSH keys as well, I have a methodology by which I can get back. And this is the part that people, you know, you really got to think about that bare metal uh, nuclear <laughs> thing that happened and be able to tabletop your way back into, okay, how would I get into it? What are the things that are going to take it out? This is something we help with business continuity planning with the business world, but it applies directly to the home lab world. Right. And it comes back to you're hopefully taking that knowledge if you work in the commercial space and applying that knowledge all the way up. It's funny that, so so you weren't referencing what I thought you were, but it's interesting that you're talking about, or that you've mentioned, um, you know, your the keys in the cloud when, my, you know, Azure has a big issue with keys right now. And it's actually part of the topic of the next podcast I'm going to be on right after this one. But then also it's interesting, and this is kind of funny. So I'll just mention this real quick. Um, you said um, something about a, a, a SAN um, disk. And mm. I thought you said, SanDisk, you know, the brand yes, of yeah, USB. The brand SanDisk is the And, and I was about. like, I'm, I'm today years old when I realized the brand SanDisk could be read as storage area network disk. I hope yes. I'm not the only one that never put that together um, until literally just this episode when he said that a few minutes ago. I thought that'd be amusing to bring up. Um, for those watching, and I'll describe it. So because those watching, I'm holding in my hand a actual ruggedized sand disk that I use. These are um, pretty nice. I have a one terabyte one, but I don't trust it by itself. It's always right. an extra copy of things, not the singular. And that's where I thought that Vice Fox News, because they were talking about they lost a bunch of footage they were storing on this. And I'm like, yeah, this is a challenge. I mean, you shoot critical footage for whatever. And for me and Jay, we can always re-record something in the lab, but that gets exponentially more expensive if you're on site doing something and you did right. an interview with someone, uh, you would want to lose that data. And I see a lot of photographers and videographers, oh yeah, we love these rugged sandals. I don't think they're bad. And there's a few competitors as well, but it's a copy. I always like to see 
on site. We've actually designed this. Uh, we helped a company design an RV full of storage servers. <laughs> so oh, they, wow. everything goes on arrays because they've lost individual disks. So they record on the cameras and bring it right to the arrays that are available in the RV. And um, that way they, they don't like, because they're on site. They're like, yeah, we, we filmed something at the Bonneville Saltville Flats. We copied the data and it instantly went to a RAID array with redundancy. And then it drives away in an RV to go to the back to the production house. Pretty cool. That but is that, that level is of redundancy cool. is what you want to be thinking about. <laughs> exactly. So, so one of the first things I'll mention uh, is to understand when you're auditing your home lab and you don't even realize it because most of the time it's a conscious effort. Um, I'll use a store, a fun story from, you know, back when I used to, um, you know, work for someone else that is kind of timely and I'll tell you how it ties into this. I had a uh, situation where, you know, it, it came up that a need, um, we were, I don't know, I don't know if it's an audit thing, but either way, the requirement was that we're auditing backups quarterly, which is reasonable. So, um, you know, one of my employees came to me like, how do we set this up? How, how are we going to do this? Like we, like, what's the best way to, um, you know, to regularly audit the backups, the, the, the images of the customer's vir virtual machines. And I'm like, well, there's, you, you, you already do that regularly. And he's like, what? No, I don't like, yeah, you do. Um, the the client has a contract where um, they also get a quarterly upgrade of the piece of software that we're hosting for them. So when when that time comes, what do we do? We grab a their most recent backup. We restore it in isolated, um, non publicly available environment to make sure you know to kind of see what would happen when we upgrade it. So that way we kind of know what things we might run into during the process. So when we go to the customer, we're like, okay, we're ready to do the upgrade. Is it okay to have a maintenance window? We've already like rehearsed the upgrade a few times and then we implement it. Now, the interesting thing about that is my employee didn't realize by giving the client a quarterly upgrade and because of the fact he had to use the most recent backup to do this, he's testing the backups quarterly because he's actually restoring the image and he's booting it up and upgrading the software and you know playing around with it just to make sure he knows. Check. We're we're auditing that uh, client's backups quarterly, literally. Um, in the home lab, you could think of this like, how often do you spin up machines, right? If you're spinning up a machine to play around with something once a week, you're technically, if you're using a template, you're auditing your template once a week, right there, done. Um, you know it works because you use it regularly. So there's going to be some things that you do regularly you may not tie into auditing, but it does check the box if you are legitimately restoring something or testing something. And that'll help eliminate any double work that you might do and then leave the things you're not auditing regularly as the things to focus on. Yes. Got to stay hydrated. Stay hydrated. <laughs> so... Going down the list then, um, one of the things I like to do is version control all the things. And this is something that I've mentioned on the podcast before. And when I say this, I don't mean that you should upload your private config files or anything to a public repository. Um, obviously, when it comes to a Git repository, the first thing we think of is there's a remote we're going to push to. But you don't have to. You could keep a Git directory local and never push it anywhere. But what? But you can commit changes all the same. And when you want to test changes or find out what's changed, you could just do a git status. If the, you know, everything's under version control, you can find out exactly what worked or what's been changed. But more importantly, if something is broken, git status, what's changed? You know what has changed from the known working config. And you could also tag the config when it's known working. So you have a known working git tag to go back to for the config. So you could put your um, your Apache web directory in version control. And I've done this. And one website I managed uh, for myself, it was the least important site. And uh, eventually someone did get in. And I didn't really care because I was thinking about, you know, getting rid of that website anyway. And I eventually did. But um, when I realized that someone had gotten in and that something was going on, I went to the, you know, WordPress directory, get status. I know exactly what files they they touched and yep. I know exactly which files to undo. And because the .git directory is owned by root, not by the web server user, you know, someone gets into the machine via the web server user, 
and they don't have a way to escalate their permissions to root, they can't alter that Git database. Now, if they did have an ability to escalate to root, I have a bigger problem, okay? Git is not gonna help you with that. If they're able to get to root, there's nothing that that um, is safe at that point. But luckily, for whatever reason, they didn't get that far, but um, the .git directory was fine. Git status, find out what's changed, revert, 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 done, go about your business. Um, that is to say, if the malware is you know rooted deep in the system, that's not gonna help you. But the point is, with version control, that may or may not help you, but it definitely won't help you if you're not using it, if you're not right. implementing it, because someday you might be thankful that you did this. And it's possible it may never pay off and it might be a complete waste of your time, but it doesn't really hurt anything to just drop a git init command into a directory and you know set that up. And that could be like the like just one way of auditing what's changed because you can go through the commit history and you know exactly what's what's happened since the last time you've audited that configuration. Absolutely. Um, you know, Jane, tell you tell me if this is still viable. Is there still some good tooling out there? Because it's been a long time since I looked at it. Years and years ago, I used, uh, I think it was called Tripwire, which I believe was an open source one. Oh, yeah. I yeah. Pages. I know. Um, there, were, there were kind of a few of them. They would notify you of changes. And I think that's kind of neat. I, you know, that's a very good, um, I, I thought net data topic for a future it. show, I guess. I we'll think it, I think it might be, but, um, doesn't net data do that or am I mistaken? I thought no. they did. No. I thought there was something I saw in there, but I, maybe I'm mistaken. Um, the but problem I someone I mentioned Wazoo, uh, okay. Wazoo is another one that would probably do something like that. Um, they do have the ability to watch for some changes. Uh, Wazoo is a fork of OSEC with a interface on it by Elastic. So it's kind of a neat product. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there is. It's one of those things where I'm so used to it being a corporate crap thing where it's just like, oh, yeah, if you want this, uh, you know, tripwire thing, you're going to have to uh, sign a statement of work. That's why I didn't know if they worked for tens of thousands um, of dollars. I think they went commercial. So what, I think there's probably yeah. some uh, options out there. Maybe that's a future home lab show we'll end up doing. I think, so. I, I think, well, I think it's interesting, too, because there's going to be some people who's, you know, at work at their day job, if they work in I.T., might be undergoing an audit, or maybe they hear that they're, the company wants to get certified ISO, SOC 2, or whatever, um, and maybe they're just starting out this process. If you look at the requirements, it's like, I mean, the requirements for SOC 2 and ISO and all these things, you can get a hold of that even without looking at the work thing and then just say, oh, what are they going to look for? Oh, maybe I should implement this. And then next yeah. thing you know, you have a SOC 2 certifiable home lab, which would be hilarious if someone put the um, six-figure dollar amount into a you know <laughs> company to audit your home lab. But if you have like a bunch of money and you just don't know what to do with it and you want the ultimate bragging rights, I'm not saying anyone should do this. It's a complete waste of time. But if you wanted to practice for an audit, that would absolutely be one thing that you could do with that. Um, but the biggest problem in my mind for home labbers is going to be silent failure. And I feel like yes. it's going to be worse than enterprise because the situation is like this, you know, when you have a situation in a company, you know, you get your people together, you figure it out. But at home, it's like you have a personal life. If it, well, I assume you do. I mean, you have something going on other than your homeland, I would hope. And that's going to take you away. I mean, you might have family you're going to spend time with or things happen or maybe it's the holidays. I don't know, whatever it is. And you just can't seem to get to check everything, but you keep getting sidetracked because you're at home with your network. And that's totally natural. It happens to everyone. But when it does, the likelihood of silent failure just in my mind, rises exponentially at that point. Like, like you prob it's, it's not going to be uncommon for someone just to not have time. It's just the way it is. So when you do set time aside or you have some kind of a schedule, it works. But silent failure should be something I feel like everyone should focus on first because you like we talked about earlier, we want to know that our data is going to be there and that it's safe. We don't want to assume that. We want to know that. And this is the only way that we're going to know that by actually auditing things that could silently fail. For example, a backup chain. Maybe you have something, maybe something like me, you have sync thing and it goes to a NAS and then that goes to um, an upstream backup server for offsite. And then maybe there's another local copy. I recently like uh, built this automation that automate or that actually synchronizes my true NAS to my Synology. So it is working fine. All my data was there. And then a week later, 
I find out it's failing. I didn't make any changes. And that leads me to how did this work in the first place? Because I find the error. I'm like, there's no way that worked, but it did. My data is indeed there. And the only way it could have gotten there is if the script ran. But, you know, these weird things come up and then I figure it out. I fix it. And then I get the synchronization going. And then, you know, that that was a silent failure. I didn't know that it was that this was going on until I looked for it. And that's just something to keep in mind. I mean, this could, um, I mean, imagine losing family photos or something because you assumed the backup chain was working and it's not. I mean, that would be horrible. Yes. That's that whole um, untested backups are wishful thinking. (laughs) I see someone, I love saying that and I see someone repeated it. (laughs) It, It's exactly the case. And it's, you know, but part of this, the part that's really hard for us, and I think it's hard for everyone, Um, There's some challenges that go into this too. Like, do you have time to look at every single photo regularly to make sure there's no corruption? I don't think anyone does. And worse, if you want to audit your Plex movies, this is where we start to get into a major challenge. You don't have time unless your Plex movie collection is like down to a few and you have like a puny movie collection, which is fine. You can audit that. You could watch those movies every year and know and know that they're working. But if you're like a lot of people and you have a bunch of movies on a Plex server, you don't have time. Like it's literally impossible for you to regularly watch all of your content. It just can't happen. There's no time in your life for that. Um, so what do you do? And that's where you start to get into... Um, some challenges. And one of the things that I feel you'll agree with, because I think this is exactly what you said last night, is if it's important to me, it has to be on ZFS. Yes. Now, I am before ZFS, okay, I had a Perl script that a friend and I were, wrote. He did most of the work because he knows Perl and I don't. But we came up with this thing and it regularly creates an MD5 sum file of every single thing on the server. If the second time it generates an MD5, if it's different, it'll email me. Oh, that file has changed and I didn't change it. Of course, it's a mess because things you changed on purpose will be there in the list. And it just was a confusing mess. But it worked. I was able to find out what's changed. But that's just so... I I mean, my home lab was tiny back then. I could never do that now. But ZFS, you have scrubbing that could help with this. And then you get into a territory of... ECC or not ECC, which would probably be a podcast episode of itself, of its own, because that's uh, been a topic of debate lately. But having the ability to scrub at least gives you some kind of um, peace of mind that it's more unlikely. You should still like pull some random files out of your backup just because you can't watch all of your video content that you have saved doesn't mean you just say, oh, I can't audit that. There's nothing wrong with pulling down a random video or even just creating a script that pulls a random video from your you know, collection and then copies it locally, and then you watch it, make sure it works, and just look at your data. I mean, that's the least you can do. But silent failure is definitely going to be a big problem, and it also hits us with cron jobs. We have, we have automations going. But how do we know that the cron job worked, right? Um, we could set it to email us, so we know if we got the email that it works. But are you going to remember that if you did not get that email that you should have gotten it, or is it just going to be filtered out in your mind and you're just going to go about your day, then there you have a silent failure, even though you have an email system. So that's when I start to look at things like healthchecks.io, where you can attach a view UID to your cron jobs, and it'll ping healthchecks.io with that UUID, and that'll clear it, and you, you set how many days you're willing to go without that being pinged, and then healthchecks.io is going to email you say, hey, look, I haven't seen anything from your cron job here in a while. I think there's a problem. Um, so, of course, that helps out, too, with when it comes to cron jobs. At least you can know that they ran. And as you go through this, you audit all the things. But at the same time, don't overdo it. Because, like I mentioned earlier, if you are regularly using templates to spin up new VMs, you're auditing your templates. You don't have to audit those anymore. You're using them regularly. It's totally fine. Um, so you got to try to know what to audit, what not to. One more thing I in the words you didn't use was bit rot. And that's what we're talking about yeah. when you can't necessarily view all your media. And that's one of the th- reasons I lean so heavy on ZFS. As long as you have a ZFS array, 
array, as in array of drives, a bunch of them together where there plural. are a way, plural, you can do it. ZFS on its own can't do anything with a scrub if it goes, hey, look, I found a rotten bit here and we've lost part of this image, part of that video in your library, but uh, we don't have the parity to fix it. When you have things on a ZFS array, when you run those scrubs, if it finds something, it'll go, oh, look, this bit is wrong on this particular drive, but no worries. If you have like a Z2, we have two more copies of it. If you have a Z3, we have three more copies of that data so we can rebuild the integrity of that file so you don't have to worry about bit rot. This is something we've run into very much so in the world of movie and film where they film a lot of things and we seen some big failures on very large commercial um quarter million dollar servers that didn't have good integrity checking and they've now moved to zfs and this problem has just gone away now it really is under the hood some of these companies run their own versions of zfs but they load all their proprietary garbage on top of it right that doesn't always create the best in my opinion user experience compared to using something like true nas and ZFS. It's one of the reasons I'm so, you know, well, as I've been told, a cult on the ZFS, but it's just where I trust my data to live. Well, it works. And, you know, it's funny. It's it's like, um, I think TLC was wrong based on what you're seeing. Uh, scrubs are good. So that, that's the takeaway. No, um, little uh, late or early 2000s mu music humor there. But um, a couple of things to mention too, I, I definitely want to throw in here. Um, I recommend running Shields Up from GRC every now and then. Ah, yes. And it's so fun. Like, like you run this and it'll let you know what ports are open. Now, obviously you can find out what ports are open yourself, but what Shields Up will do is it goes outside your network and comes back. Can it hit your network and come back? Well, if it can't, then uh, that's pretty good. You, you don't want it to have a two-way conversation, right? But, um, and, and of course I might be oversimplifying or, or possibly slightly incorrect about how it works because I don't really know what it does in the background. But what I do know is you run this and it'll tell you which ports are open. And the reason why you do this is you want to make sure something didn't open up that wasn't open before. You know, maybe you installed something new and didn't catch the fact that it's publicly available on a certain port. This is something that will help you determine this and find out if if something that's not a obviously a situation where if you pass this test, you're bulletproof. It just means you have no low hanging fruit when it comes to ports. Doesn't mean you're invincible, means that you have a good starting point, but at least you know when something opens up. And um, Shodan is a good solution too, if you have a domain and you want to um, have some kind of an alerting on that, because you, and you taught me this, you could have an email sent to you that yes. A new service opened up as well. If, if you have a domain, a static IP and all that. Yeah, uh, just a static IP is all that's needed. Of note, mm -hmm. uh, keep an eye on the, I believe they still do this almost, uh, they've done the last few years, Black Friday sales. You can get like these uh, long time subscriptions and get like five IPs monitored for a really flat price uh, on Shodan. They're really inexpensive um, when they have their sales for things. They, they encourage it on like the home lab and basic user stuff to get a paid account. And that paid account comes with that monitoring of IPs, which I think is really cool. And I also want to mention Linus, L-Y-N-I-S. Yes. That, you know, because it's we're not talking about Linus Tech Tips. We're not talking about Linus Torvalds. It's the third Linus, the third this, wheel here. You know, the... It's, it's a great, a great Linus. It, it's a great Linus. So even though it's a third wheel, it, it's actually really good. Um, so this one is, is you basically get download the community uh, community edition. I pay for it because I'm a business. Um, you get more things, but um, what what you could do with Linus is it it gives you a ridiculous amount of detail about the security of your system, and you want this. I mean, you want something that's really going to look at every freaking detail to the point where the length of this list is annoying how many things it finds. No matter how good you are, it's going to find some things. Um, I, I I thought I'd, I had somebody in my audience hit 70% or something, and that's pretty impressive, actually. Yeah. Um, so you look at this list, and it's going to complain about everything, like the message of the day down to kernel parameters and tuning and um, potential things. It's, it's obviously not going to make you 100% bulletproof, nothing will, but... This tool, and I have a video about this, it really dives in deep. So if you want to do a security audit on your systems, and it's a per system thing, unless you have their uh, cloud offering, but you just run it on your systems and you get this report. And there's a way to generate an HTML report if you want. You can just uh, SCP that back to your desktop, uh, open it in your, in your browser, and you just 
scroll through a list of things that it's complaining about, some of the things you might not care about. Maybe you don't care if you have a message of the day, like whatever, um, that's up to you. But there's going to be some things that you should care about that's going to be mo more egregious. For example, um, you know, this setting in your Apache or Nginx might be insecure, might want to change this. What are your ciphers? Uh, things like that. It, it's a really good tool. And you can check out the video if you want to find out how to use it. But it's something that I make sure is installed on everything every single time. How is it spelled? L L Y N I S. Y N I S. I'm putting that to make sure. I wanted to make sure we had the um, yep. spelling exact for people Googling it. So L Y N I S. And I, I'm going to put a link to the video in the uh, description as well. Yep. And, and that'll teach you basically how to use it and everything. It, it's just a good idea to, it, it's it's fast. You can scroll through it, find out, um, you know, what, whatever is like rated like super high as far as like a vulnerability is concerned. Focus on that. I mean, the low scoring things you could fix if you want to, but at least fix the egregious things that will probably be the most likely to uh, make you have a very long day in the home lab that you didn't want. Uh, that That's not for the right reason. Not because you discovered a great web app, you are fixing things because someone broke it on you and you don't want that. So um, it's just try your best to avoid that would be a great thing to do. Obviously, if we get into security, we already have uh, topics our, or shows on that. We can mention CrowdSec and all these other things, but I won't because we you know, talked about that before. But that's just a great tool to audit. I highly yeah. recommend it. And it's been added to the notes. Yep. So it'll be in the it'll be in the description. And of course, that follow anything in our description follows over to our show notes. So L Y N I S. And nice from thing. here, it's it's I think we get to a realm where it's impossible for me to give any further advice because I feel like after this, we get into the territory of it depends on what you're running. Okay. And that depends or determines what you should be auditing. Um, if you're running containers, well, obviously you should audit that. I'm a big fan of when you're implementing things, and we both do this, um, before it enters production, break it, implement it again, break it, implement it again, tear it down, build it back up until you have it down to the you know fewest steps to get it running. That's what we do for videos because we rehearse this over and over again. I mean, you might be seeing anywhere from the second attempt to the 15th attempt by the time we film it. That's why it looks so good because we've we've gone through this over <laughs> and over and over again. And we've we got it down to the smallest number of steps. But you don't have to create video content to have that mindset. You can absolutely do that in your home lab because once you have it down to that, you could implement it and know exactly what's required to make it work. If you want to automate it later, later you have the smaller number of steps or smallest number of steps. So you also have the bare minimum automation to get it running. At that point, um, you, you make sure your data is good, that it's backed up, it's secure, tear it down. Can it build back up? Are you Have, have you restored something from your templates lately? Like spin up a new VM, why, why not? Just, just try something new in a VM you have to spin up from your template anyway, so you're testing your template. And after that, it just, again, depends on what you're running, because I'm not going to give you advice on um, auditing NextCloud if you're not running it, because at that point, it doesn't really matter. So then we, you know, like I said, it just gets into the personal preference at that point. Yep. So from the beginning, like we said, table top it out for what it looks like for disaster recovery for you. That's really yep. important. Take some time to rebuild any of those applications and, you know, in the end, get a little more secure Run these tools like Linus and kind of audit some of your things. And you can go further. It's just I know people mentioned like Wazoo and some of those, but you those are a little bit more complicated. So it's not like you just like, right. hey, one click install Wazoo and it gave me all the information I needed. There's a little bit more in depth. And of course, there's also the results that come out of Wazoo that will take some more in depth on there. It depends on your skill level. Although I think it's a great project. Absolutely. I think you absolutely should dive into it. But uh, is it a little out of scope of what we're talking about today on the simple side? Yes. But hey, I always encourage people uh, dig deeper. There's good documentation on that particular thing. Take, take a look to it. Some of the OSEC documentation because I, I used to run OSEC forever ago, and it's definitely a neat project, how it works and how it manages things. And I, it's just really cool. You should also avoid time negative situations. And, the, and you kind of reminded me of this for some reason where, you know, it's okay if something is too overwhelming to learn right now. I mean, some people get to a point where they're like, oh, I must be stupid. I can't learn this. No, you're not stupid. You're human. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm human too because my allergies are uh, creeping up on me again. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. But don't just force yourself to learn something because you feel like you have to. 
um, in that same amount of time that you're trying to force yourself to learn something that might just be like, you know, o- way over your skill level, and it's okay for someone to be over your skill level, it probably would have been better just to do it manually at that point. Because the same amount of time that you're trying to force yourself to learn something, that same time could have been spent manually doing it. And it's okay to put something you want to learn on the shelf and come back to it in a year when you've gained more skills. So it's not like an end all thing when it comes to a complicated solution, but at least don't be so enthused about learning something to audit that you don't audit because that defeats the whole point. Yeah. All right. We have hopefully dropped you a little bit more knowledge, a little bit more things and uh, added to your to do list. Cause this is definitely um, lots to do. Go check all that. Make sure your home lab is up and secure. You know where all your data is and test those backups folks. Cause untested backups are wishful thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's it. All right. Uh, check out some of the releasing videos. Jay's got a whole just ton of tutorials he's been dropping for us on Linux. So if you uh, want to do some learning of Linux, Learn Linux TV is your place for that. Check out my channels. I got a few new videos on Unify and PFSense. So, you know, more comparisons. And I have a few more coming. Always love hearing from you. So engage with us uh, on the socials that you find. Uh, we love yep. hearing back from you from the feedback. Feedback at the home lab show dot com. Uh, I'm sorry, at the home lab dot show. <laughs> Right, yeah. We're so thing dot com. We're we're old school like that. I, I know old school, man. So nonetheless, and we'll see you next time. Take care.